Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. It's a 10 o'clock block on a given Thursday with Tom Yamachika, and he's the president of Tax Foundation of the, of, uh, of Hawaii. And uh, his, he, he's here as a, what do I say, co-host, contributor, regular person uh, here on Talking Tax with Tom. Today, we're going to talk about how uh, raising taxes does not necessarily raise money. This is the kind of thing you have to think about as a taxpayer and a citizen of the state of Hawaii. Hi, Tom. Hey, Jay. G uh, glad to be here uh, on a given Thursday. <laughs> so what about, uh, you know, we know taxes go up, taxes never go down, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we get the money they say they are getting their, you know, using the tax increases to get. Um, where does that break down? Okay, well, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is a very interesting um, economic discussion paper that came out in October of 2019 uh, by two economists, uh, one uh, associated with the University of California, Berkeley. And they uh, published a paper titled Taxing Billionaires, Estate Tax and the Geographical Location of the Wealthy. And in that paper, they tried to predict the likelihood and conditions under which uh, the ultra wealthy people uh, would vote with their feet and move in response to a tax increase. And specifically, they're looking at a tax increase in the estate tax. And, and, I, and I suppose they looked at that because that's a tax uh, that typically only affects the wealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, even in our state, it doesn't even kick in until uh, $5.45 million in, in, in your taxable estate. So uh, we're not talking the run-of-the-mill people you find in the street here. Uh, you know, we're talking about people that have substantial means and presumably the ability to set roots down anywhere they want. You know, what's what uh, makes it a little worse is that it's highly political, isn't it? If you track the um, uh, increases and decreases in estate tax and estate tax um, floors and ceilings and rates over the past, what? Well, our careers, Tom, uh, they've been up and down half a dozen times, haven't they? Yeah, well, in our state, in our state, it's always more the, more toward the top. But uh, yes, they, they have they have come and gone. And as we've seen in this past legislative session, uh, they've, um, you know, flirted with the idea of uh, dethroning California as the as the nation's number one high tax state. OK, <laughs> I get you. <laughs> yeah. And, and by far, they were considering a, 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 an increase in the top tax rate to 16 percent. Well, while California is at 13.3. Okay. But, okay. Anyway, so so what does this mean in terms of um, you know um, uh, walking with your feet? Okay. Here's what the study tried to do. They tried to uh, look at these uh, this population of uh, these 400 rich people. Uh, we call them the Forbes 400 because they're off a list published by Forbes magazine. And um, and they did some mathematical modeling, and they tried to they tried to answer the question, okay, if your state adopts, because a lot of states haven't, or adds to an estate tax, are you going to make money? And um, so the the study had a couple of different uh, scenarios in it. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, walk walk you through uh, what happened. The, one of them was uh, that that the state imposed a new estate tax only on billionaires. Okay, so uh, reaching the ultra ultra wealthy, and uh, they tried to quantify the probability or the expected value uh, of having a particular person move out of state. And and when a person moves out of state, of course, they take with them whatever they are contributing to the state in terms of income tax and sales tax, uh, or in our case, the general excise. Okay, and 
when they and and the, and the economists said they, they didn't know what they were going to find when they started doing the study but uh, when they uh, modeled it out when they uh, when they applied the billionaires tax they found that most states in fact did make money except for two california and hawaii they 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 found that the expected present value of having that type of estate tax was $73 million minus that we would lose money if we instituted a billionaire's estate tax. So because, we, because when the billionaire leaves town, he's not paying the other taxes. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. And, and those can be considerable. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Oftentimes, billionaires may take with them, you know, businesses that they run, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they they don't, you know, they're, they're not necessarily just sitting on money they inherited from somebody else. Uh, a lot of times, they're entrepreneurs, and uh, you know, the headquarters of their business is going to follow them. Well, are they really? I mean, uh, a question: If if you know, if I'm going to vote with my feet. Uh, and I'm aggravated that I'm going to have to pay a state tax in one state. I go to another state where there's no state tax. But from a business point of view, um, the tax structure in the first state is better for me. Um, you know, the corporate or the LLC tax structure, however you structure, or partnership tax, tax structure is better in state one than state two. Um, that business is going to essentially decide by itself. So they're not necessarily coupled in a lot of cases. Don't you agree? Yeah, but we have um, uh, very harsh taxes, uh, even on the income tax side. Mm -hmm. Now, that's and, true. If Hawaii is not competitive on income tax, it's going to lose people no matter what, whether they're billionaires, whether they live here or there or anywhere. That's right. And, and and you know hold that thought because that'll go into the you know the, the the next part of our show which is going to be discussing what the whys and the wherefores. But but let me present you the other scenario. The other scenario is these same economists modeled a uh, a more broad based estate tax, either adding to it or implementing it if the state didn't already have it. Um, and, and I think what they were looking at is is a, is a cutoff around the um, place where a federal estate tax kicks in, which of course ours kicks in earlier. But uh, that's kind of what they were looking at. And there they found uh, that eight states were expected to come up short. Okay, meaning, uh, meaning that uh, you know, like the two states in the previous example. Eight states would be expected to lose money if they adopted the broad-based estate tax. Okay, mm -hmm. of the states that didn't have an estate tax now, four of them were at risk: California, Idaho, Nebraska, and New Jersey. Of the state that did have an estate tax, another four were at risk: Vermont, Oregon, Minnesota, and you guessed it, Hawaii. <laughs> Okay, now the, the study didn't pin down exactly when or why a state would be at, at risk for losing money uh, if adopting an estate tax, but some people who have looked at the study uh, noticed, a, noticed a, a commonality between the states that were at risk. They all had high income tax rates. Mm -hmm. And you and you, you kind of think about it, you know, uh, a lot of businesses, especially closely held ones, uh, operate through partnership forms, um, not necessarily, you know, partnerships could be S corporations, but it, uh, or limited liability companies, uh, structures in which the tax of the business is being paid by the individuals running it, okay, at the individual income tax rates. So that's why the individual income tax is is very, very important. And And by the way, uh, it's been estimated that 75% of all businesses uh, are structured in this way. You know, not not with not with corporations. Pass-throughs. 
Yeah, yeah with, with, with pass-throughs. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, uh, corporations have their own advantages, but they but they have double taxation. They have taxation at the corporate rate, and when they distribute dividends to their shareholders, uh, those get taxed at the individual rate also. So uh, there's a an inherent disadvantage there, which is probably why a lot of businesses have decided to go with pass through, and that's why the individual income tax rates are critically important mm -hmm. in figuring out, you know, why, uh, you know, people will consider, you know, packing up and leaving. Mm -hmm. Let me add a thought though into this mixture of uh, elements. Boy, it sounds complicated, and and the modeling would have been complicated because so many factors, so many states, so many possibilities, but. You know, um, the the estate tax, in my view, has always been more consequential on the federal level, and um, un regrettably, that's also become politicized and it's changed a number of times in the past what twenty years, thirty years, uh, for political purposes, not not necessarily revenue raising or the public good or national interest. Um, no, because um, you know one party or another wants to. Uh, help its um, you know primary uh, uh, you know uh, members, and so they will raise it or lower it as as they see fit. Um, but fact is, it's national. Fact is, you know you can't go from one state to another state and avoid the impact of the federal estate or gift tax. It is <clears throat> it's on you, no matter where you are. Matter of fact, if you're an American citizen, a resident. Well, or non-resident, but American citizen, you have to pay those taxes uh, as well as income, uh, federal income tax, wherever you are in the world. So, I mean, that's a great leveler, isn't it? It's an equalizer. And so if I took away, of course, it's nice to have, you know, and it's constitutional uh, to allow all states to impose their own income tax. But if every state gave up a state tax and you raise the a federal estate tax to a, a rate you know that is more egalitarian than now you know with these high thresholds then you would have uniform effect all around the country and there would be no uh, you know pack up and leave motivation well there uh, still would if be you did that the, the estate tax is is imposed like at the federal level yeah. based on where your domicile is so if uh, you know, and if and if you're wealthy enough, and the and the bite's hard enough, uh, some people consider, and some people do, uh, pack up their pack up their bags, uh, go to a foreign country. Oh, that's true. And I, I, sure, a lot of people do that. However, however, if if you're looking to equalize, if you're looking to avoid this kind of one percent disparity we find ourselves in right now, where wealth is pat wealth and power is passed down from generation to generation. And if you look, you know, year to year and decade to decade, you find that some people are incredibly wealthy and some people are incredibly poor. And there's a huge disparity. If you wanted to at least try to equalize that, to level the playing field, what you would do is you would make the state tax much stiffer. You would have it apply to all American citizens. Well, it does now. <clears throat> and and you would know, make high rates too, so that uh, the old man cannot leave billions to his kids. And I mean, I don't have any problem with that at all. And in fact, I wonder why we don't do that. Because what's happening is, you know, we're developing a, a kind of aristocracy in this country where people are not only wealthy, but they pass it on essentially tax free um, to the next generation. And they're wealthy and they don't have to work. And they're always going to be wealthy and goes from generation to generation. Is that what we want in this democracy? No, it's not. So I think the federal government has been remiss uh, in allowing the thresholds to get that high and the rates to get that low. It would well, it's better. always been a balance of, um, you know, the, the kind of social considerations that, that you just mentioned versus, look, uh, we're supposed to be capitalists here. We're supposed to uh, be able to uh, innovate and uh, be smart. And if we're smart, uh, we make our mark in society and earn money. And if we earn enough money, uh, we should get to keep it. Uh, that's you know that's well, the counterbalance. Okay, philosophy. we have a philosophical difference on that because uh, yes, that's absolutely true for the generation that works and earns it and is smart and entrepreneurial and all that. 
but they, they should not be able to pass it on to their kids generation after generation. And uh, the kids don't have to work, never will. Um, and that whole area of the family is aristocracy. Now, this does not affect the capital structure of the country to do that because you go public, you know, you have other stockholders, public or not, uh, you know, who, who, who have a piece of this company. The company continues uh, a, a high, even a confiscatory estate, estate tax on a federal level is not going to it's not going to disrupt um, the concentration of capital, so to speak, around. Yeah, the except that the executives will move away. Well, because they, that's because true. they don't want that. Yeah, if they feel they need to do that, then they got to do it. Yeah, um, but, and, but we, can, we can't was... stop that. But we, what we can stop is the accumulation of wealth in extraordinary amounts now, which has been happening. I mean, there's a there's a policy breakdown here. Yeah, no, and, and again, that's something um, it's, it's more of an ideological thing to be, you know, dealt with at a national level. And that's why we have a Congress. Uh, uh, well, we used to have a Congress, Tom. We, we used to, <laughs> well, we, we when, used to when have When we did have government. a Congress, <laughs> when we did have a Congress, um, the, the, the estate tax law was uh, a lot uh, a lot easier in that it allowed a what we call a pickup credit. So uh, the, 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 the feds would give uh, you know, the state in which the taxpayer lived the opportunity to impose their own tax, uh, but the feds would specify the amount. And, and, and most states did that. And then, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, about a decade ago, uh, that went out the window. Okay. So uh, the, uh, the, the feds basically said, okay, no more of this pickup tax states, you got to do, do it yourself. And and uh, right now, um, only I think twenty three states have a, an estate tax. Uh, we're one of them. For for my money, none of them need to have an estate tax. You know, because if they if they all repeal their estate tax tomorrow morning, um, that would be okay, and that would deal with the problem. You know, vote with your feet problem that you described uh, earlier, or at least a, a substantial part of it. Let's have income taxes. Let's have, um, you know, uh, county taxes and sales taxes. And but doesn't that contradict it. what you just said earlier? I mean, yeah, I, I thought you were a fan of the confiscatory estate tax. So at the uh, federal level, no, it doesn't. It's not inconsistent. At the federal level, we need to raise the taxes on estates, and and we should be doing that. Unfortunately, without a Congress, we're not likely to do it. And with a you know very uh, strong um, agenda by the Republican Party, we're not likely to do it if they're in power or in semi-power. Uh, they'll vote against it every single time because the rich like to perpetuate their mm, their wealth. And so you really have to have a whole new approach at the federal level. But in a perfect world, that's what would happen. And the federal government, Congress, when there is a Congress, if there is a Congress again would say, wait, we have to avoid the passing of wealth in such huge amounts from one generation to another. And so we're gonna, we're gonna have a confiscatory estate tax. You, if you're a billionaire, you're gonna give up a good part of it when you die. You can do planning, you can get your tax lawyer and all that, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, the threshold is gonna be low and the tax rate is gonna be high. And that would solve a lot of our social problems. It, but then people will find a way around it. I mean, well, that, well they always do, but you have to start in a good place. I mean, you know, that, <laughs> it's the American way. But you, you know, if you start in a place where the estate tax, estate tax threshold is is you know five ten million dollars and the rate is low, uh, where you go from there? You have to have the statute to at least set the parameters. Okay, that's a little bit different discussion from from what we're talking about now. Um, what I wanted to talk about, you know, here is basically to illustrate the the fallacy of the, uh, you know, of the proposition that you know if you raise taxes you'll make more money, mm -hmm. and 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 really, you know, when you're at or you're in a state like uh, like ours, where uh, the citizenry is already taxed to the hilt, uh, you got to know that there's a tipping point. And by tipping point, I mean uh, people get on planes or ships or you know whatever they have to do to get the heck out of here uh, and and avoid the uh, you know the bite. 
Well, isn't that happening already? I mean, any any sentient person can make the comparison the study made and say, wait a minute, we are paying way too much in tax in the state. You know, the, what did Randy Roth call it? The price of paradise. Um, it's way too high. So I'm, I'm out of here. You know, I took a trip to Oregon a few years ago and I walked into a store to buy something and Tom, there was no sales tax or gross excise tax at all. I paid the sticker price and it felt like I was in heaven, that nobody was nickel diming me, uh, you know, for sales tax or use tax or gross excise tax. Um, this was, there was an emancipation uh, and that's very attractive. Even if the rate is that, you know, is not that great when you compare it, fact is it feels better not to have to pay tax. And there are many states like Oregon. Right, and then there, there are states that do the other, uh, you know, have the other parameter and that is Oregon uh, has, has no sales tax, but it has an income tax. Washington, which is like on its Northern border uh, has the opposite. It has no income tax, but it has sales tax. So everybody lives on the border in Washington. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you have our eighth island, which, I mean, our ninth island, which, which is the state of Nevada. And they don't have a personal income tax either. And that's where a lot of our, you know, our, our wealthy people wind up going to. I mean, I, I have, I've had clients that, uh, that packed up and, and, and left and went to Nevada for that very reason. Well, how kind actually is the state of Hawaii to retired people. I guess it's not nearly as kind as a state which doesn't have an income tax at all. But <clears throat> does it does it incentivize retired people to stay here, live here? Uh, we we do exempt certain kinds of pensions. Not all. <clears throat> uh, we 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 uh, exempt like the pensions from defined benefit plans, like the uh, the ones that the state gives to its workers um, uh, and pensions that are entirely em employer funded. Uh, if you if you're getting a, a retirement uh, check from a 401k plan uh, where where you had the uh, ability to contribute to it yourself and you did, uh, then of course that's going to be taxable like uh, like in most other states. Mm -hmm. That's 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 probably the the biggest uh, incentive that we give to retired people. Well, I can see as a matter of public policy, the state of Hawaii would not be all that interested in providing incentives like that. I mean, it's a certain move not only to you know reduce the number of tourists, but it's to reduce the number of immigrants. You know, and immigrants are largely these days, or have been traditionally, um, they they've been retired people. So, you know, looking, looking at it from a you know, larger point of view, uh, and of course, being mindful of the fact that, you know, there's a commerce clause and you can't differentiate. But, but you know, I think one way to discourage people from coming here, especially retirees, is not to give them that many breaks. So while there was a time in, in Hawaii history where we wanted to attract them because they were, you know, they were retirees, they, all they did was spend money all day, I'm not sure that feeling exists these days. What do you think? Well, um, if you're talking about the specific incentive that we give to retirees, like the pension exclusion, uh, Governor Abercrombie tried to get rid of it. He became a one-term governor. I mean, the, the backlash was so fierce, uh, it, it, it surprised lots of people, including him. <laughs> they do vote. <laughs> Oh, they do. Yes, I mean that's they. They have a lot of the, a lot of time in their hands, and and they exercise it. Yes. So at the end of the day, okay, looking down from the fifty thousand foot level and being mindful of the fact that, however complicated the algorithms are and the study studies you mentioned, um, people do vote with their feet. And if I'm you know retired or I feel I'm paying too much tax and and the price of paradise ain't worth it, then I'm going to take off. So if you're the policymaker in the legislature or the governor, who may not think of this as much as the legislature does, um, what do you do? What do you do to balance it? How do you achieve a balance which will, you know, retain populations, um, but also collect tax? 
Well, I mean, that's that's exactly uh, what you have to do. You have to uh, maintain a balance. I mean, it's been it's been said by uh, some English lord long, long time ago uh, that the art of taxation is like uh, you know plucking a goose. The <laughs> the the idea uh, is to get as many feathers as you can uh, and minimize the hissing, <laughs> and without making the goose fly away. <laughs> Or killing the goose. Yeah. <laughs> There's been a lot of literary reference to that. <laughs> okay, yeah, but well, can we drill down? I mean, what would you do exactly right now today? Uh, you know, in terms of the balance. Yeah, in terms of the balance, I think you really got to get the government's cost center control. Right. Uh, I, I think uh, right now there are several instances that have been, uh, you know, leaked to the media already uh, over the past several years where, uh, you know, government spending is rampant. The, uh, the means to control them uh, is non-existent. Uh, there are special funds all over the place that um, are there basically to evade uh, oversight. Uh, and legislators are now just beginning to get their hands around it um and 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 trying to grapple with the the actual true costs of running government who in the legislature i mean what structurally what committees what chairs um and what staffers and what members of consulting members of the tax office are involved in this process and to what extent does the governor and his staff get involved? Well, there's always a there's always a budget review um, that's supposed to go on every year. Uh, the The primary agency is the Department of Budget and Finance. Uh, the uh, legislators hold hearings every year on the budget of every agency. Uh, agency is supposed to tell them what they you know what they did uh, for the for the public good and that they should be and, and they and they argue that their programs that uh got these results should be continued and if they are uh, getting you know good results for the people uh then i think they should be continued but uh if you got some iffy stuff um things that people don't use if, if it's a kind of a nice to have rather than a an essential government service you got to consider getting rid of it not Absolutely. just not just keeping it keep, keeping it around because uh, you know you have union members that uh, uh, will otherwise have to look for other work. <laughs> well, you know <clears throat> when we come on and have these discussions, Tom, we're we're largely talking about efficiency. We're talking about efficiency in the way state government handles money, and we're talking about efficiency in the way mm, the tax structure is designed. Um, you know, and uh, I guess what I come to after our various discussions uh, in and around the subject is we're not all that efficient, um, and, and we and we tend we tend to make mistakes, and the mistakes um, you know do have an effect when people vote with their feet, and people do you know well, we know that the level of in migration to Hawaii has declined. In fact, I think we have a significant out migration, and and it seems to me also that uh, apropos you know the original title of this show is if we don't do it right the worst case analysis is we collect too much tax we lose our tax base and then we don't have the money we had hoped to achieve by increasing the tax so it has a reverse effect on our ability to manage our our state of fiscal affairs Am I and, right? that's a, and that's a very real risk yes are, are we going there now we're going there now we, I mean, there there is way more of a risk, I think, than uh, than lawmakers are now considering. Wow, I always feel sobered up after we have these discussions, Tom. <laughs> you got to stop drinking at night, then, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just but just remember the goose. <laughs> uh, uh, vodka they make vodka with goose okay thank you <laughs> thank you very much tommy amachika president of tax foundation of hawaii helping us understand the world in which we live uh, the, the tax and fiscal considerations of of, this, of the state of hawaii thank you so much tom tommy amachika thank, 
Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me on the show. Hello.